I was born in Chesapeake City, Maryland uh, in the early 30s, 1932 to be in fact, in Kent County, in Cecil County, Maryland. My parents were George Wright and Alice Wright. My dad was born in around Middletown. I know very little about my father because he and my mother separated very early. But my mother was born right in the same house that I was born in, in Chesapeake City, Maryland. My mother was a chef or at that time, I don't know what they would have called them, but she was the head cook at uh, Schaefer's Canal House in Chesapeake City, Maryland. My father did a variety of things. He drove a truck, he did a lot of labor jobs, and a little bit of everything, and uh, just to make sure we uh, had food on the table, even though we were, he and my mother had separated. I, Basically, my mother and I stayed with my uh, grandfather. My grandmother died very early in my mother's, uh, when my mother was young. And I uh, lived, my mother and I lived with her father for many, many years in the same house. And you know, strange about that house because uh, when you look at it, you wonder how could a person uh, of that modest income obtain a house like that on the waterfront. This house sits on a waterfront. And uh, he obtained that house somewhere through, uh, somehow through uh, his employer. And the stories of that he brought home one day the kitchen portion of the house on a horse and buggy and connected it to the house, which is still in, in place today. I went to, I started school in a one-room schoolhouse uh, in Chesapeake City, Maryland. I went there for five years and uh, then I moved on to uh, Elkton at George Washington Carver. You know, it's strange, I try to keep my uh, kids and grandkids uh, uh, aware of the history and how things go. I remember taking my grandson to see this one-room schoolhouse and I thought I was teaching him a little history and to when I looked around after showing him the schoolhouse I went to, he was on the ground laughing and rolling, and he's questioning, "Well, where's the cafeteria, and where's the, uh, and where's the uh, playground?" I said, "What you see is what you get." But I came out of I was the last class of 11th grade school system. And then the very next year they went 12 years, but the year I graduated, we only went 11 years. And it was kind of unusual uh, uh, to think that uh, you only went 11 years and now, you know, starting in 1950, the year after I graduated, you had to go 12 years. I went to college at uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. At that time, it was Maryland State College in Princess Anne, Maryland. Some strange stories about uh, uh, Maryland State in the early years. You know, uh, very small colleges, and for some entertainment, uh, we had to go downtown. It was a strange thing about that. We, I remember one night uh, going downtown to the movies and uh, never encountered anything like this. I remember at this portion, even in my hometown, to go to the movies, you had to go upstairs. But in Princess Anne, we went upstairs, and uh, uh, at the end of the movie, uh, a police officer came, put his arms out, and let the other folks out until when they got out, we could leave. But upstairs is where we had to sit, and we could not leave the movie until the other folks got out. I went into the Army in 1952. I was stationed at Fort Knox. Uh, in fact, I stayed there for two years of my military career as an instructor. In fact, we were the first group of uh, basic trainees that was integrated. It was the first time that blacks and white integrated for training. And it was an experience because I went in this basic training with uh, people from Georgia, Mississippi, Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia. Quite an experience because it wasn't a lot of friction, but you could tell there was some uh, thoughts of people not being too friendly. But at the end of this training, I remembered one 
gentleman that came to me and he hugged me and shook my hand and he said, you know, when I came here, I was very prejudiced. He said, but when I met you and see the way you handled yourself, I was so impressed. My impression of blacks was that you didn't keep yourself clean, you were abusive of your women, you drank. He said, I never seen you drink. And every day I seen you in the shower two or three times a day. And he said, I'm going home with a totally different impression of what I expected when I came into service. I came back to uh, Smyrna in 1953. I got married. I came home and got married in, in my military uniform. I'll never forget that. And my wedding was in my uh, grandfather's house, very informal, just a few relatives. And uh, then I went back to camp. And after the Army, I came back to uh, Chesapeake and I was ready to go north to try to find a job because I knew it wasn't much around. And my wife convinced me, well, let's go live in Smyrna. And we did. We moved to Smyrna and uh, the rest is history. I said, I'll stay for a year. And that year turned into never leave. For a while, I did a little bit of everything, wherever I could find a job. My career was going to be based on typically what was available and you take what you can get and I did a lot of variety of things and in in 1956 I went to Dover Air Force Base I got a job uh, as a cargo handler offloading trucks and I uh, started there in 1956 offloading trucks and my career basically took off and uh, I went from that job to a forklift operator, to a warehouse assistant foreman. And it was a strange thing happened because the job I was in was going to be deleted. And I remember I was told that uh, uh, I would have to go back driving a forklift. Well, that didn't happen. And I ended up in a, in a job uh, basically planting loads on, on the aircraft that was uh, departing over Air Force Base. And from that point on, uh, my uh, career took off because when I started in 1956 as a cargo handler, uh, to the point that when I retired in 1989, I was the number two guy at Dover Air Force Base in terms of position. So from a cargo handler to the number two jobs when I retired in 1989. I took a, a volunteer position as an EEO counselor and I advised and handled EEO complaints and uh, worked very hard on affirmative action. And I remember, uh, I believe it was 1975, the job of Equal Employment Opportunity Officer came open and I, uh, I didn't apply because I didn't think I would uh, qualify. But I had done so many things as far as affirmative action was concerned that uh, uh, the wing commander said to me one night at the officers club, he said, George, how come you didn't apply for that EEO job? I said, I don't qualify. And I remembered uh, he, he talking to the civilian personnel officer and he said, uh, George says he doesn't qualify for the EEO job. And he said, uh, why is that? He said, I don't know. Well, the next Monday I was in the uh, civilian personnel officer's uh, office and he told me some things. Well, to cut the story short, within two weeks I was in the EEO job. And from there I went to uh, another position as chief of staffing and then when I retired uh, my career took me to uh, uh, chief of staffing and I was also up for the civilian personnel officer job, which was the number one job at Dover Air Force Base. But you have to remember the times, and I think they were not quite ready for me in that position. And I don't regret it. It's just the thought of coming from the very last job to be able to compete for the top job. I was still over in Aerial Port uh, in, uh, in a position of uh, loading, uh, in charge of loading uh, aircraft. And I was selected among a team of five that visit bases throughout Europe 
And what we did was to uh, draft a transportation movement plan for the movement of cargo throughout the European bases to expedite cargo faster movement and to save money. And uh, we were on a 21 day trip and we went to Spain, England, Turkey, Greece, and at the end of that, we set up a transportation movement plan. In the very first year, we saved almost $2 million. And that plan is still in effect today of the movement of cargo throughout Europe. And I was quite honored to be among the only civilian on that team and to uh, come from Dover Air Force Base. And I was the only one from Dover Air Force Base. It was members from throughout the United States. I had an opportunity uh, among legislators and judges to visit the Berlin Wall. Uh, and I thought that was quite a thrill to be able to go to the Berlin Wall and see some things that uh, possibly I never would have seen. And you know, we had that fear of Russian and their uh, military strength. And that was the time that I no longer felt that we had to fear Russia because I've seen people standing in line to get bread and milk on the East, on the East German side of Europe. And then I got a chance to see the uh, uh, plans where we had aircraft stationed up in Turkey and Alaska that could have attacked Russia. And I lost all the fear that I might have had for Russia at that point. If someone can't even uh, give their own people bread and milk, how are they gonna conquer another country? I moved in Smyrna in 1954, and we moved in a brand new house on Locust Street, the very end of the town. And a brand new house, and, but it had a dirt street. And my neighbor and I, uh, we complained, uh, you know, how come we're paying taxes and we have a dirt street? Well, we fought, and next thing you know, we had a paved street. So uh, he said to me, won't you run for council? I said, no, I don't have any experience. I said, why don't you? You know, he was well educated. And he said, no, but you got a lot on the ball. You know how to talk. You know how to, you know, exhibit yourself. So in 1957, uh, I ran for council and uh, I didn't do very well. But I was told I could have done much better had I not put my picture in a paper. It was strange because in this community, there were four George Wrights, and I happened to be the only Afro-American. And, and someone said, had you just ran on your name, you would uh, have won. And uh, so I did, I ran and ran and ran, and finally in 1969, I got elected to council. And that's where I, I served uh, three terms as a councilman, and in 1981, I became the mayor. And strangely enough, I won by 20 votes. And from that point on, for six more terms, I never had an opponent. Smyrna was typical of uh, Southern Delaware. It was like, uh, you know, roll up the sidewalks at five o'clock, everything's fine. We didn't want any growth. We didn't want anybody coming in, and I couldn't see any future with that jobs, and uh, there was not much interest in jobs. But I, uh, I fought hard and uh, got the land for an industrial park, which is where the Walmart uh, distribution center sits today, and a very huge industri industrial park. I obtained land for uh, parkland development, and strangely enough, just last year, that park was named in my name. The town of Smyrna's mayor and council wish to take this opportunity to recognize George C. Wright Jr. for his unyielding service and support to the town of Smyrna and to municipal governments throughout the state of Delaware, hereby dedicating George C. Wright Jr. Municipal Park in his honor. And you know, it's strange because it's not a memorial park, it's a municipal part. I got a chance to see it myself, you know. I didn't see it from heaven looking down. So it is named after me and I'm very pleased of that accomplishment. Well, as, as you can see, my career took off at Dover Air Force Base. So I had a chance to work 
the budget process on civilian jobs. In fact, I was in charge of uh, the budget for civilian jobs, uh, had to come through my office with the Air Force Base. We started out with a, a, a budget of about $7 million, and, and before the end of the year, we were down to $5 million. So I learned the budgetary process. I knew how to plan. Uh, I knew how to do things on emergency situations, and it made my job much easier as the mayor because I was in a position of authority, and it uh, just made me able to bring people together to communicate and start thinking outside the box. Before that, everybody just went to council meeting, and it was just routine, no thoughts about tomorrow, no improvements. Uh, uh, just a meeting and no thoughts of the future and how we're going to improve. So Dover Air Force put me in a position of, of really knowing how to bring things together in planning and not just for today but for the future. If you go back and look at our history, I think back in the early 70s, we were, uh, we were stated as being the most uh, prejudiced town in the, in the state of Delaware. And we had some situations, just like you see in Baltimore, people on the streets doing some things that they shouldn't be doing. And uh, we were able to uh, basically turn that around and trying to make people understand that we ha in order to make a better community, you have to participate and you have to basically become involved. So some of the things that's happened in Baltimore and Ferguson, Missouri, happened in Smyrna in the, in the 70s. I became very much involved with the Delaware League of Local Governments when I became a councilman in 1969. The Delaware League of Governments represents 57 towns, cities, and villages, uh, and we work together on legislation. Uh, we meet uh, with our state legislators and we basically try to make sure that uh, our voice is heard and things that we need to make our municipalities uh, uh, safe and money flowing through our local communities uh, is done through the Delaware League of Local Government. And basically, uh, uh, we try to work closely not only with uh, the state government, but we work closely with the uh, federal government for funding and legislation and things that it will have an impact on our municipalities. And I was very much involved with that league and I ended up serving uh, as president of the league. And at the time when I retired in eight, 1989, I was president of the league and the executive director uh, got sick and I filled in for him. And uh, we basically started looking for a uh, executive director and uh, we were interviewing some folks for the job and uh, I was told that uh, I think we got our candidate and I said well wait a minute I didn't see anybody that looked that good to me and they said no we want you to take the job so uh, in 1991 I took the job as executive director and I just retired uh, last year and I would have probably been still there other than I start having some problem uh, with my hearing and I said it's time to move on. But again, I had a good career in the uh, development of the Delaware Legal Local Government. Delaware became involved not only in Delaware but throughout uh, 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 the uh, United States. Delaware was really known. In fact, uh, just uh, a few years ago, uh, the vice president came to the National, they invited the vice president, which is Joe Biden, to come speak at the National League uh, Convention, conference. And he said, I'll do it, but I, I want George Wright to introduce me. So there I stood in front of 5,000 people introducing our vice president of the United States, and that was quite an honor. There are so many things that I, my granddaughter would be the one sitting here because she knows more about uh, what I have done in, in the past because I'm not one that likes to talk about me. I'm very humble in my career.
But one of the things that uh, I had an opportunity, I thought I was a fairly good baseball player. And I was a member of a team called the Smyrna All-Star. We were semi-pro league. And again, I was on the team and they asked me to be the manager. Well, you know me, if I'm going to be the leader, I want to be the best. And I took that team uh, for over 10 years and we had a championship team. We played some of the best semi-pro teams throughout the state of Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And just a few years ago, I was named a, a member of the Afro-American Sports Hall of Fame as a baseball manager. And I'm not, you know, you don't hear me brag or, and I tell you I'm humble, but I, I'm not too humble when it comes to that baseball thing because I knew some tricks and trades of how to win games and I knew how to do things to upset the opposing teams and uh, I had a pretty good reputation as being a good manager. And it, again, it comes from all the little skills of understanding human behavior and, and how to put it to work on, uh, on the baseball field. And uh, I, uh, I was pretty good, I have to admit that. When I started playing baseball, I think I was about 15 years old and I played on a, a semi-pro team out of Elkton, uh, Maryland. And you know, uh, strangely enough, as I was getting older and I, I thought I was this hot shot uh, shortstop and, uh, and I uh, thought I could make the pros. And I went for a try it and I realized that I, not only was I not that good, I wasn't even average, you know, because there was just so many other people out there that really had talents and I thought I was this talented guy, but uh, doing that playoff just made me realize hey, you only are just about an average. I'm not even so sure you're average, you know. But I, I enjoyed uh, uh, that experience with baseball. And it was, uh, and I was, uh, I try to talk history to my granddaughter and her kids and family. And I just mentioned something that she didn't know until about, I guess about six months ago. I had an opportunity to uh, run in the Penn Relays in 1949 and our track team, uh, 440 Relays, and, uh, and I, I never even give it a thought or brought it up. And she thought it was just fantastic that, that I hadn't mentioned it. And we ran second in that uh, 440 Relays up in uh, Penn Relays in 1949. The Biggs Museum is one of the best kept secrets in the state of Delaware. It's one of the best museums uh, in the whole state, and I was invited to be on a trustee of that uh, Biggs Museum, and I got in there, and I, I was, it was only a two-year appointment. I ended up staying six years, and I learned so much about art and the significance and importance of people being uh, a part of what the real world is today, and it's, it's its history. I travel all over the world on vacations and I've been in my job as the league director in every state in the United States and I try to be, uh, try to go somewhere historic on everywhere and to think that I've been all these places across the world and throughout Europe and uh, in the historical churches and stuff and I had never been to the Biggs Museum in Dover, Delaware and uh, that doesn't speak well of myself to travel and visit historical places and then don't even go to the places uh, in Delaware. And that was quite an honor to uh, be able to serve on that Biggs Museum board. And I, I left there last year, was my last year on the board. And I, I really, really enjoyed that. You know, one thing, again, I, there's so much uh, I hadn't put in my bio and my granddaughter keeps putting it together. And I, when I was put together, I was honored uh, for the Masonic uh, organization. And uh, one of the things that people didn't understand is that uh, I had been director of the Head Start program in the town of Smyrna. So I was the director for that for uh, five years. And I did that as an unpaid job. I did that as a part-time job. And they, I asked them to use my salary to help the program. But I, that was not a full-time job, but uh, I did it as a part-time. 
It's not about me, it's been basically, if everybody, you know, everybody's born with a purpose. And you shouldn't go to your grave not knowing what your purpose was. And I think the purpose of my life was to help people. And to this day, there's not a day gone but goes by that I don't find a way to help somebody. Uh, you know, and I feel that's just so important to find out what your purpose is in life and put your heart and soul into it and do what you think is the, is the right thing. The thing that it took me to uh, just look back at the past and realize that what a good family I have. And I must have did a pretty good job because all of a sudden my family is, are, are my best friends. I do things with my kids and my grandkids and I realize that uh, I must have uh, done a pretty good job and, and raising my family and I'm so proud of the fact that they have accomplished so much and they still include me as an integral part of, of their lives and my lives. So the thing, the biggest accomplishment I think I've got is that I can close my eyes someday and realize that I've got a good family and they're going to go on without me. And I think I, uh, uh, as, as if you talk to any of them, they'll tell you we're together and we do things together. And I just feel like with all the accomplishments and all the things that's happened has nothing to do with the fact that if I had accomplished all that and my family wasn't together and they were falling apart, what, would, what good would the accomplishment have been? It would have been null and void. And I'm just so proud that uh, uh, every Sunday uh, I'm at either one of my daughters or my granddaughters and we sit around the table just like we used to do in the old days. And we sit at the table, we say grace, we had food and we just sit there and something will be discussed to make us a better person. Now, I'm 83 years old and I learn from my kids and my great grandkids. Every day there's something to learn. And that's what's wrong with the world today because we lost that family unity. I try to look the way I am and you might not always like what I say or do. I try to set a good example, uh, not only for my kids, but for my grandkids and everybody around me. And it took me a long while to feel this way. It's not being arrogant, but it's very, it's very true to who I am. You might not like what you see in me, but you're gonna respect who I am because I'm never gonna be anything other than the guy you see. I'm not gonna be disrespectful and I'm not gonna lie, you disrespect me. You, gonna, you might not like me, but in the end, you're gonna respect me.